You're listening to Reach MD, the channel for medical professionals. Hi, this is Dr. Thomas Berceau, president of the National Lipid Association, and I'd like to welcome you to Lipid Luminations, hosted by Dr. Larry Kaskill and presented by the National Lipid Association. Joining me today is Dr. Carl Oringer, a visiting associate professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and a practicing cardiologist in Cleveland, Ohio. And he's here to discuss the newest evidence-based guidelines for heart disease prevention and the changes from the previous guidelines issued. Dr. Oringer, welcome to Lipid Luminations. Thank you, Larry. I'd like to have you start off if you could review for us some of the basic principles that the NECP has put out as guidelines for CHD risk assessment and treatment. Well, the National Cholesterol Education Program Adult Treatment Panel 3 recommends counting traditional risk factors, and these include cigarette smoking, hypertension, or on treatment for high blood pressure, low HDL cholesterol, which means less than 40 milligrams per deciliter, a family history of premature coronary disease and first-degree relatives and premature means under the age of 55 in men or under the age of 65 in women, and age, which is greater than or equal to age 45 in men and greater than or equal to age 55 in women. And then Framingham risk scoring is advocated for those individuals who have two or more risk factors that we just discussed. And then statistical modeling is used to estimate the likelihood of coronary events, and lipid management recommendations are made based on the principle of matching treatment intensity to estimated risk level. So there are easily obtainable tables. The Vascular Biology Working Group, for example, has tables on their website where you can basically plug any of these risk factors into those tables. You come up with a number of points, and then based upon the number of points, a person's 10-year risk of developing a myocardial infarction or coronary death is estimated based upon the number of points that a male or a female patient has. And then the Adult Treatment Panel 3 used those point systems to basically help physicians to know what intensity of treatment should be used for LDL cholesterol. And so the very high risk category, for example, those who've had recent acute coronary syndromes or patients who have coronary heart disease with diabetes or coronary heart disease and multiple risk factors, the LDL goal is less than 70. Those who have stable coronary disease or coronary risk equivalent states, the LDL cholesterol goal is less than 100, but with an optional goal less than 70. Those who have just two risk factors, but a 10 to 20% Framingham risk, the LDL cholesterol goal is less than 100. Moderate risk, where they have two risk factors, but a Framingham risk less than 10%, the LDL goal is less than 130. And then those who have either zero or one risk factor, the LDL goal is considered to be less than 160. So that's kind of an overview of the National Cholesterol Education Program Adult Treatment Panel 3 guidelines that has come out over the last few years. And I know there's a newer approach, 2007 evidence-based guidelines for heart disease prevention in women. Can you comment on that? Sure. Well, actually, it's been suggested that women should be treated in a somewhat different fashion. The expert panel writing group actually published this in circulation in 2007, and they classified women as being either at high risk, at risk, or low risk. Low risk means Framingham risk score less than 10%, healthy lifestyle, and no risk factors. At risk means at least one major risk factor, like cigarette smoking, a poor diet, physical inactivity, obesity, family history of early heart disease, hypertension, or lipid disorder. So that's if you have one or more of those risk factors, or if you have evidence of subclinical vascular disease, like an elevated coronary calcium score or increased carotid intima media thickness on, on imaging of the carotid arteries, or if a patient has metabolic syndrome or just a poor exercise capacity, any of those would be considered to be placing a female patient at risk. Now, then there's the high-risk group, and those are patients who have established coronary disease, those who have documented cerebrovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, abdominal aortic aneurysms or type 2 diabetes or chronic renal disease or using Framingham risk scoring greater than 20% 10-year risk, those are considered to be high-risk patients. And then once you classify your female patient according to those risk levels, it is then suggested according to these updated guidelines in 2007 that those patients who are assessed as being not at high risk 
Basically, if their cholesterol is elevated or their blood pressure is elevated, you should get those under control. And then only after that should you consider other recommendations such as raising HDL, treating triglycerides, and aspirin if women are greater than age 65. Now, if the high-risk status is present, as we talked about, those with coronary disease, cerebrovascular, peripheral vascular disease, abdominal aortic aneurysm, diabetes, renal disease, or a 10-year risk greater than 20%, the question is then, did the patient have a recent coronary event? If they had a recent coronary event, it is suggested that the patient should be referred to rehab and intensive medical therapy should be undertaken. If they've not had a recent event, It is then suggested that their LDL cholesterol should be lowered, blood pressure should be treated, omega-3 fatty acids should be considered, and another important point was is that if depression is present, it is recommended that depression be aggressively sought after and treated. So this is a little bit in variance with National Cholesterol Education Program guidelines in that they have three levels of risk, and then they treat according to whether high-risk status is present or high-risk status is absent, but in the end... The idea here is count risk factors, treat blood pressure, treat cholesterol, and treat in accordance with what is presumed to be the patient's risk factor burden. Well, Dr. Oringer, what do you see as some of the major limitations that these approaches have in predicting someone's CHD risk? Well, you know, there are a few basic limitations. First of all, the risk modeling from Framingham is based upon a Caucasian middle class New England population and not everyone in the world is Caucasian, middle-class, New Englander. Secondly, Framingham risk scoring overestimates risk in various groups like Japanese Americans, Native Americans, and Hispanics. And then it is suggested that you should use recalibration formulas in those patients. And of course, since many doctors don't even do Framingham risk scoring, the thought that they're going to do recalibration formulas is, I think, wishful thinking. Now, some say, well, maybe Framingham risk scoring should just be done as advocated by the National Cholesterol Education Program 3. And, you know, that's an interesting thought, but in reality, there have been no randomized controlled clinical trials that show actually that Framingham risk scoring based approach improves clinical outcomes. Some have said, well, maybe Framingham risk scoring should be used because of its known predictive power for coronary events. The problem is that Framingham risk scoring is reasonably good to predict coronary risk in groups of patients with various levels of risk factor, but not necessarily in the patient sitting across from you. And that's the issue. A patient comes to you, they want to know if they are at risk for disease, and you are giving them recommendations based upon groups with presumably similar characteristics, but in fact, every patient is different. If you've just tuned in, you're listening to Lipid Luminations on ReachMD XM160, the channel for medical professionals. I'm Dr. Larry Kaskill, and I'm talking with Dr. Carl Oringer, a visiting associate professor of medicine at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and a practicing cardiologist in Cleveland, Ohio. And we're talking about newer evidence-based guidelines for heart disease prevention. Dr. Oringer, I, I recently heard you give a talk at the National Lipid Association meetings in Seattle, and you talked about the Educate program, which you were pretty involved with. And I was wondering if you could tell our listeners who were not able to hear that talk a little bit about the program. Well, you know, there's been a paradigm shift now in consideration of the use of coronary risk factors. The traditional approach has been that we assess risk factors, we then make decisions with regard to therapy for prevention. But there's a new paradigm that we're now considering, and this was actually suggested by Scott Grundy in Circulation in 2008 in a recent editorial that he did. And his suggestion was we might want to think about assessing risk factors, which you then use to select patients for imaging, non-invasive imaging like coronary calcium scoring or carotid intima media thickness measurement, assess plaque burden, and then once you assess plaque burden, determine the intensity of therapy that is used for prevention. And that's kind of the idea that we have used in employing a coronary calcium scoring based approach for an aggressive prevention program at University Hospital's Case Medical Center. In fact, there are four pretty compelling reasons to measure coronary calcium score and coronary risk assessment. First of all, it definitively diagnoses and quantifies coronary atherosclerosis. You don't get coronary calcium for reasons other than atherosclerosis. Secondly, it provides accurate prognostic information for risk of coronary death and non-fatal MI. Third, at every level of Framingham risk, 
the knowledge of coronary calcium provides additional predictive information for the patient who's at risk. And finally, it aids in coronary risk prediction in type 2 diabetics and in various underrepresented groups, such as minorities, younger patients, and females. And so we have some very clear information that we've derived from coronary calcium scoring. For example, a paper that was presented in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology in 2007, which was the American College of Cardiology Foundation American Heart Association expert consensus document on coronary calcium scoring, pointed out that in a group of over 8,000 asymptomatic patients with more than one risk factor, a coronary calcium score of basically 1 to 99 was associated with a 0.4% annual risk of coronary heart disease death or non-fatal myocardial infarction. If your calcium score is 100 to 399, your annual risk is 1.3% or a 13% 10-year risk. And if your coronary calcium score is 400 or greater, you are considered to be in a high-risk group, a 2.4% annual risk, which is basically a coronary risk equivalent state. And the beauty of this is, is that you as a physician make treatment decisions based upon whether or not atherosclerosis is present. You're not doing it based upon whether risk factors for atherosclerosis are present. You're doing it based upon whether the disease is actually present. But the question you have to think of is why has calcium scoring not been more widely applied for coronary risk prediction? The probable reason for that is, is that the National Cholesterol Education Program and other scoring systems have advocated traditional risk factor-based models. Secondly, there's a generally a widespread lack of availability of coronary calcium scoring in most primary care settings. Third, there have really been no clear-cut physician guidelines for patient management based upon coronary calcium scores. And finally, it's expensive in most places, and it's not covered by insurance. So with that in mind, then, I was very interested to see a paper that was presented in the American Journal of Cardiology Supplement in 2006, which described the Screening for Heart Attack Prevention and Education Program, or the so-called SHAPE program, in which they suggested that asymptomatic men over the age of 45 and women over the age of 55 who did not have any manifestations of coronary disease or coronary risk equivalent states undergo atherosclerosis testing. Those who had negative tests were treated in a more modest fashion with milder LDL cholesterol goals, and those who had clear evidence of coronary atherosclerosis were treated more aggressively with lower LDL cholesterol goals. And those who had coronary risk equivalent states, it was suggested that they should undergo non-invasive testing. And when the testing was abnormal, even consideration was given to recommending coronary angiography. Well, my last question, Dr. Oringer, is there are critics out there who think that we are doing too many CAT scans on people, and if you are doing routine scans of 100,000 people, you're going to create some cancers and find some incidental lomas that'll require follow-up scans. What would you say to those critics? Uh, There is reasonable concern about whether we may be creating disease, and one of the first and foremost things that we are taught in medical school is, above all, do not harm the patient. The reality is, however, that the use of coronary calcium scoring submits the patient to an extremely low dose radiation, about one to one and a half millisieverts of radiation. Now, you've got to understand, if you think about that, during the course of a year, walking around, taking an occasional plane flight, or doing all the activities we normally do, we are submitted to three millisieverts of radiation. This is a very, very low radiation exposure for a diagnostic test. For example, a nuclear stress test uh, submits the patient to 15 millisieverts of radiation. Traditional CT angiography submitted the patient to a similar amount, about 15, although there are some newer techniques that have reduced that significantly to the range of 5 to 8. And a cardiac catheterization provides roughly 20 millisieverts of radiation. So we're not talking about a test that one has to get on a recurrent basis. We're talking about a test that one gets only on at selected times. And one of the key things that we talked about in the beginning was the cost of this test. In our medical center, our hospital and our radiologists have uh, decided to offer this test to our patient population for $99. So the uh, issue of, of cost, while not completely addressed, has really been addressed in a very vigorous way since in most places throughout the United States, the cost is significantly higher than that. So it was really done in a fashion that we felt this was important for good patient care, and it really helps us to make decisions about who should be treated and who should not be treated. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank Dr. Carl Oringer very much for coming on the show. Thank you very much, Larry. 
Thank you for listening to Lipid Luminations, presented by the National Lipid Association. For more information, visit www.lipid.org.